Pathogens evolve in lots of different ways, and they pursue their own agendas in what can sometimes be a very nuanced fashion. Now we're going to talk about how they can evade and suppress the immune system. They can evade it by altering their surface properties. Viruses uh, undergo antigenic shift in influenza. They can become latent, that is, they can insert themselves into the genome, and they can wait then until the immune response uh, subsides before they emerge. Bacteria uh, can have population diversity in their surface properties. They can vary uh, their surface properties with frame shifts. And the uh, eukaryotic parasites, Plasmodium and Trypanosoma, which have more complicated cells, can produce antigenic switching in a way which is somewhat similar to the way that bacteria vary their surface properties. Retroviruses hide inside the genome, and other organisms hide inside cells. Plasmodium, trypanosoma, toxoplasma, mycobacterium, and listeria are all intracellular parasites. Finally, uh, pathogens suppress or disrupt immune function. They can do so by producing proteins that disrupt immune signals. They can block intracellular defenses. They can slow the recruitment of immune cells, and they can actually kill immune cells. All of these things happen. Let's take a look at immune suppression. Herpes, cytomegalovirus, and vaccinia inhibit immunity in the blood by disrupting receptors. Vaccinia, myxoma, and Epstein-Barr virus, which causes mononucleosis and uh, several cancers, inhibit inflammatory responses. They do that by disrupting signaling molecules and by changing the ability of cells to stick to each other. Herpes simplex and cytomegalovirus block antigen processing by inhibiting gene expression and peptide transport. And the Epstein-Barr virus immune, immunosuppresses the host, and it does that by producing uh, molecules that mimic interleukins. Interleukins are molecules that send signals between cells that mediate immune response. Finally, paramyxovirus, which causes mumps and measles, can disrupt the cytoplasmic sensors of viral RNA, essentially making the cells blind to the fact that they're being infected by this virus. If we look at bacteria, Many bacteria vary their surface properties. So among the bacteria that do this are Yersinia pestis, which causes plague, Campylobacter, which causes very bad diarrhea, Helicobacter, which causes stomach ulcers and stomach uh, cancer, but may also be protective against autoimmune disease, E. coli, which lives in our gut normally, uh, and Neisseria, which causes gonorrhea. So these are, there, there are many others. These are all bacteria that can vary their surface properties with what are called simple sequence repeats. These are varying the uh, nature of something found on the surface of the bacterium, either a membrane protein or a lipooligosaccharide or the pilus of the bacterium or an adhesin or the bacterial stress response. So these are all interaction molecules interacting with the host. This is just a simple diagram showing that if you have a different number of sequence repeats, then it gets very easy during the process of replication to have a squinch up here, which would a little bend in the DNA, which means that one nucleotide will be added. Or if this is occurring on the other strand, then it will cause one nucleotide to be deleted. That causes a frame shift, and the frame shift then produces an amino acid substitution. So some of the phenotypic consequences here can be seen in Haemophilus influenzae. 
These are four different kinds of bacterial cell surfaces. Noi ac is a sialic acid that can be added or dropped. It's in blue. Gal is galactose that can be added or dropped. It's in orange. And PC is phosphorylcholine that can be added or dropped. It's in green. And the basic take home here is that you can get lots of different combinations of these things on bacterial surfaces as a result of this mismatch that goes on because of the trinucleotide repeats. That, to emphasize that point a little bit, those mismatches that we get from this sort of cellular variation are a problem for the immune system because one class of immune molecules will get recruited to attack, say, type 1, and as soon as it starts going down, then type 2 will take over, and the immune system will have to react again. And that is why the production of different cell surface molecules aids the bacterial population, because it delays the response of the immune system. Now, some bacteria hide inside host cells. Listeria, which causes listeriosis, it can move from macrophage to macrophage without ever emerging into the extracellular environment. Toxoplasma gondii, it causes toxoplasmosis, makes a vesicle inside which it is invisible to the immune system. Mycobacterium, which causes leprosy, spreads by converting nerve cells into stem cells, and those stem cells then invade tissue. It stays inside those cells the whole time. Now, the importance of this fact, that these bacteria are hiding inside host cells, is that they are not exposed to the adaptive immune system in the bloodstream. In other words, they are not running into immunoglobulins, and they are not triggering an adaptive recruitment of cells to produce molecules that would lead to their identification and their elimination by T killer cells. Okay? So hiding inside host cells is a very clever sort of way of going about doing things. Plasmodium, the malaria, malaria uh, causal agent, actually has immune evasion in two hosts, both in the human and in the mosquito. In humans and in other vertebrates, it hides inside cells and it's very, it varies its surface molecules. And in mosquitoes, its oocyst coats itself and mimics a mosquito cell, and it immunosuppresses when necessary. So it actually has evolved systems of dealing with both environments. This is the complex malarial life cycle. I won't step through it in all detail. This is the human host over here, and this is the mosquito host over here. And when the uh, mosquito bites, a sporozoite goes into the liver, where it actually is hid, hiding a bit in the liver. But when it produces then the schizonts that infect blood cells, it lives inside the blood cell. And we will see in a moment how important that is. When it goes back into the mosquito, it is then inside either the midgut or forming sporozoites that go into the salivary gland. And that is where it is coating itself to mimic mosquito cells and immunosuppressing the mosquito host. So in the liver of the human, it is interacting with T cells and cytokines. And they are very difficult things to deal with. In the bloodstream, there are antibodies, cytokines, and free radicals. And it's hiding from them inside the blood cell. In the mosquito host, it is going to be subject to melanization and phagocytosis. There is a very active uh, anti-pathogen response in insects. And that can happen in the salivary gland. That can happen in the gut wall. And in the gut itself, it is exposed to lysis. That is, it can be attacked by gut enzymes. So if you think about living life as a malaria pathogen, you are exposed to a regular sequence of very threatening events. And they have evolved adaptations to avoid all of them. 
in the vertebrate host, in humans, malaria is spending quite a bit of its time inside a red blood cell. And red blood cells don't carry MHC class I proteins. That is, they don't express self. That means there's no immune surveillance by cytotoxic T cells. So it's fairly clever to live in such a place. But the red blood cells can be cleared in the spleen where they can be recognized. And they can be recognized in the spleen because they become more rigid. In other words, if they have those little malaria sporozoites living inside of them, the spleen can detect that. Now, how does it avoid getting cleared by the spleen? Well, it inserts proteins called PFEMP1s, PFEMP1s, into the surface of the red blood cell. It makes the red blood cells sticky, and that means that they go through the spleen more slowly. But there is a byproduct of that. Because they become sticky, they can also stick to capillaries in the brain, and that can cause cerebral malaria. So in fact, some of the worst kind of malaria is actually a byproduct of the fact that the pathogen is trying to keep from getting cleared by the spleen. The immune system targets cells that have this protein expressed in them. It elicits an antibody response. So, what would happen is that the parasites start increasing in number. They're making a particular version of this protein. The immune system picks up on it, starts to react. The immunity ramps up, and the parasite gets eliminated. So how does the parasite evade it? Well, it turns out that this protein is coded for by about 60 different genes. And they're scattered throughout, our, throughout the malaria genome. Only one of them is expressed at a time, and the switch from one to another is about 2% per infected red blood cell. What that does is it means that the immune system is always out of phase with the parasite. The parasite goes up and starts to crash, but before it's gone, another version is coming up with a different protein. It starts to crash, but before it's gone, another version comes up, and this sequence of colors here shows you that, in fact, at that, with, with this mechanism, the malaria pathogen is always present in the bloodstream in significant concentration, and the immune system is always running to keep up. Trypanosomes are another classical case of this sort of strategy, antigenic variation. The trypanosomatida are single-celled protists that have a single flagellum. Where that flagellum is on their body determines how they are categorized by morphology. They are all exclusively parasitic, and they cause sleeping sickness, Chagas disease, and leishmaniasis. So they look something like this. They can be amastigote, promastigote, epimastigote, tripomastigote, and so forth. And it all depends on where the flagellum is and whether it's attached or not attached, and so forth. There's antigenic variation in many trypanosomes. Here's a trypanosome in, with a background of red blood cells. And basically what you see is a female with a male kind of inserted inside of it. They live extracellularly in the blood. They don't hide inside cells like malaria. So they're targeted by the antibody response. And they have a surface that is covered with a dense coat of a single protein. That's called VSG, variable surface glycoprotein. It undergoes frequent genetic modification. And the antigenic variation is what lets the infection survive. The result, as you can see here, is that the concentration of trypanosomes in the blood of someone who has sleeping sickness goes up and crashes and goes up and crashes and goes up and crashes and so forth. And you might want to think about how this sort of mechanism of antigenic variation could produce a pattern that looks like this. The x-axis in this case is in days. Well, variable surface protein recycling is uh, steered by these genes. And there are more than 1,500 of these variant surface glycoprotein genes in the trypanosome genome. Most of them are in silent arrays. And that means that most of them are pseudogenes, at least operationally. They're not currently being expressed. We don't yet really understand how the pseudogenes are recruited and recombined to produce a gene that is actually expressed and encodes a functional code. 
We do know that only one of these is expressed at a time, and there are about 15 different expression site transcription units. So there are 15 different places in the genome where it could be expressed. Only one is expressed at a time, so that means that cycling could be going on among those 15, but there's a backup library of 1,500 that could be involved. Now, another thing that pathogens can do, instead of evading the immune system, is suppress it, actually go in and knock it out. The TB bacteria, mycobacterium, blocks the fusion of phagosomes with lysosomes. Plasmodium, the malaria pathogen, has sporozytes that slow the recruitment of T cells, so they slow down the immune reaction against them. Leishmania lives in neutrophils and in dendritic cells, those are both immune cells, and it blocks their maturation. If you block the maturation of a dendritic cell, then the signal that an infection is in the body never gets passed to the adaptive immune system. That's the role of dendritic cells. They go take a chunk of the pathogen and they present it to other cells that then recruit, expand, and go back to attack it. So that's effectively cutting the enemy's line of communication. They also, Leishmania also expresses a protein that disrupts host immune signaling. From viruses to worms, there are pathogens that produce enzymes that disrupt immune function. So, for example, toxoplasma phosphorylates a host resistance protein. And hookworms suppress intestinal proteases. They stimulate production of the immune cells that reduce inflammation. Another general mechanism, pretty widely used, is to disrupt the immune system with uh, cysteine proteases, okay, that modulate the immune reaction. Now, you may recall from your biochemistry that cysteine has a sulfur on it, and a cysteine protease is breaking a sulfur-sulfur bond. These are bonds that are very strong. They're covalent bonds, okay, and that means that these proteases are targeting one of the most stable parts of that protein structure. They are produced by worms, amoebae, leishmania, plasmodium, trypanosoma, bacteria, and viruses. Obviously, they're an effective way of knocking out the enemy's defenses because they have been evolved so many times. They cleave immunoglobulin Gs. Those are antibodies that are in blood and lymph. They modulate interleukin concentrations, and they can thereby control immune cell populations. So that's a fairly uh, strong intervention. To summarize, most pathogens have evolved mechanisms that either evade or suppress the immune system. Some vary their surface properties, some hide inside cells, some manipulate signals, some cleave antibodies, and some actually kill immune cells. Given that array of the different weapons that pathogens have developed to deal with vertebrate immune systems, I think it's a wonder that we do so well in how we fight them off. The vertebrate immune system is, in fact, flexible enough and powerful enough that eventually it can deal with all of these properties if the patient can just stay alive long enough.